This is Ben May, and I'm glad that you're with us as we continue to seek the old paths. If you have been studying with us, you know that we are now in the very last lesson of the series that we started, oh, about three months ago. It's from the, our study guide, You Should Be My People. And we have covered the time from the children of Israel's captivity in Egypt. They were slaves there to Moses through God, of course, uh, brought them out. And now they are poised, ready to go into the promised land to invade and conquer that land. And so this is, again, the last lesson in that series that I hope you've enjoyed. Now, if you haven't been with us, I'm glad that you're with us this time. And I encourage you all to go ahead and order, if you haven't already done so, the next study guide. It's called In the Days of the Judges. And it's about the conquest of the land and the period of the judges. We find that um, they'll be under new leadership, as we'll see in this lesson. God's going to be with Joshua, just as he was with Moses, in the sense of, of uh, fulfilling every promise. Now, there never will be another prophet like Moses, not until Christ comes, where God is speaking to him face to face. But Joshua is one that uh, the Lord's going to now cause the people to have confidence in, as we'll see as we study our lesson. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn to Joshua. Joshua, the first chapter, and we'll start there uh, in just uh, a few minutes. Now, uh, we have again come to the end of a long journey. We find at the opening of the book of Joshua that, that Moses is dead. They have a new leader now, Joshua, hence the name of the book, Joshua. The 40 years of wandering, though, are not yet complete. They are, they are on the verge of that being complete. Now, I'm going to open up my study guide and encourage you to do the same thing as uh, we, we come again to the end. And we are at the events here at Gilgal. As, as we'll see, we'll see that at the end of, uh, of our lesson. We find that, that they're just about now to cross the River Jordan. Now... Again, they have a new leader. Can you imagine sometimes there's turmoil in that? We see that in our country. In fact, at the particular time of this recording, we're changing presidents. And so there's a transition to go through. Here they are. They've been wandering for 40 years. We'll touch on the reasons why of that in, in a few minutes. And, and now the, the leader that has brought them through thick and thin, that has literally saved their lives on more than one occasion, He's died because of his own sin. He was not allowed to enter the promised land. And here's his new leader. I had to be some degree of apprehension about that. Israel now is camped east of the Jordan River. The Jordan River is a, is a good way uh, to fix in our minds the, a landmark there that typically when we think about the promised land, we think about the land on the west side of the Jordan River, and yet we noticed in our last study that there is a lot of land, almost as much as now on the right side, the east side, as there is on the west side, or there will be. And so we, we studied about the plains of Moab and the events that happened there. That's across from Jericho. And now they are at Abel Shittim, or Shittim or Acacia Grove, your, your version may may have may have some notes about that in the margin if you notice on our map now you'll see that where they are camped is is uh, directly across from jericho jericho is very important because that's going to be their first city that they are going to uh, to conquer now god says to joshua it's time now it's time for israel to cross the jordan and take canaan now they for weeks now they've been camped there getting ready to go in and the Lord tells them just where the borders of their land is going to be. He says, from the wilderness uh, and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward uh, the going down on the sun shall be your territory. You can see on the map here the general area that that's going to be. Sadly, as they become unfaithful, we'll see that land just start shrinking as their enemies are allowed to retake territory 
again, because of Israel's unfaithfulness, not because their enemy was some, something special. And so God promises Joshua, I'm going to be with you. I, I, I appreciate what is said more than once to Joshua. If you have your Bibles, and you'll notice uh, as, as in chapter 1, as this is unfolding, there is a familiar phrase. We see it, for instance, in verse 6. God says to Joshua, be strong and of good courage. And he says that um, more than once. Look at verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. This is the new man. This is Joshua. And he needs that encouragement from the Lord. Now, there's one thing God says to Joshua that God requires of him. Keep the law. Keep the law. Now, now that's not saying that's an easy thing. But that's Joshua's uh, command from the Lord. As it is with all the children of Israel, you do what the Lord has commanded through his law. And so to, uh, to fill, up, fill up the reading that we saw where he said, Be strong and courageous, look at Joshua 1 and uh, verses 6 through 8. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So now Joshua, he, he's prepared now to cross the Jordan. Now, he has officers now to go tell the people that in three days, Three days we're going. He says, you, you consecrate yourself. You make sure that you're not unclean and, and such, and you be ready to cross. And he tells the, the, he reminded the tribes who were going to inherit their land on the east side about their promise. You remember Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh had promised that uh, while they wanted to inherit the land that they had taken from King Sahan and King Og on the right side of the river, the east side, they promise now, we're going to go over though. We're going to help our brethren take the land just as their brethren helped them take their land, as it turned out, so they would do as well. And so they are reminded of that. It's very important. Now, before actually going over now and, and uh, taking the land, Joshua sent two men out to spy out Jericho. Now, you think about the two. That, does that ring a bell with you. Remember from our previous studies? Remember when spies were sent originally 40 years prior to this date, sent to spy out the land of Canaan? Remember how many they sent out? Well, they sent 12 out, didn't they? One from each tribe. But do you remember how many of those 12 were faithful who believed they could take the land? Two. Joshua and Caleb. Now this time they just send two out. Maybe there's a connection. The Lord doesn't say. But the two spies now, they go and they have a very specific place. They're going to Jericho. That's the first place that they're going to, to conquer. And so the, the two spies go and they stay in the house of Rahab. Now Rahab, interestingly, is a harlot. Perhaps they chose a harlot's house, not because they, they were going because of her business as a harlot. Or we'd say a prostitute. And again, but not, not a temple prostitute. Uh, one that, uh, but, but one more along the lines that we might think of. And so it wouldn't raise as much suspicion, men going into a harlot's house. But it, uh, as often was the case, the king has his informers, and the king is informed that there's two spies come, have, have entered our city, and they were already nervous. They knew the children of Israel were camped over there in the plains of Moab, and they were already afraid of them because they had heard about their crossing the Red Sea on dry land and what they did to King Sihon and King Og. But now, to Rahab's credit, she hides the spies on her roof. And because they come to her house to, to see where these men are. And Rahab knew already, as we've said. She knew, and she tells them, she knows of the things that God has already accomplished for Israel. And that God is going to give them this land that they are about to enter in. She asks a favor, you might say. 
Uh, in return for her having hid them and saved their lives, she asked for the, her life and the lives of her family because she knows they're going to attack and they're going to win. And so Rahab has assurances that as long as you bring your family here to this place, nobody will harm them. She lets them out the window. She, her house was, was there at the wall of the city, and she lets them out evidently with this scarlet cord so they can escape the city. And the spies tell her now, now the only way that this is going to work is you don't tell anybody about our business here. You make sure your family is here in this room, and you make sure this scarlet cord is hanging out the window. Now, if you don't do that, then we're going to be free from our oath. Not one person will be harmed, he says. And if anybody is harmed, then their blood will be on our head. And so that's how they left it. Now, interesting about Rahab, Rahab the harlot. This is not the only time you'll see her name mentioned. If you have your Bibles, look at Matthew chapter 1. In uh, Matthew chapter 1, here is a genealogy of Christ. Would it surprise you to see Rahab, a harlot, in the genealogy of Christ? Matthew 1, verse 5. Simon begat Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begat Obed by Ruth. Obed begat Jesse. So that's Simon begat Boaz by Rahab. There's a wonderful story in the book of Ruth. Ruth and Rahab. Well, Ra uh, Ruth and Obed, I meant to say, Rahab was in that family. She was the mother of, of uh, Boaz. And so, um, not only that, though, if you have, again, it's in our New Testament, let's look at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 is a great chapter of faith. And we find in Hebrews chapter 11, as it lists all those great people of faith, Abraham and Noah and uh, um David and all those, you know, we think of being such wonderful examples for us of our faith. But notice in verse 31, By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. She had faith in God. And, and here she's mentioned in this great chapter about those heroes of faith. But look at another one, James chapter 2. James chapter 2. James here is talking about how that if you say you have faith, but you have no works, your faith is dead because it's alone. And now here he uses the example uh, of Rahab. And uh, James chapter 2 and verse 25, Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Why, she could have just had that faith to herself. And, you know, I believe... I believe this God is going to conquer. But she put that faith to work, didn't she? And uh, she hid those spies and then sent them out another way. And so uh, Rahab, in our story here, is mentioned um, at least three times that I'm aware of in our New Testaments. Well, the spies now, they're let down and they're told, oh, you, you stay, sort of lay low for a while. And they finally, they, after three days, they return to camp and they give Joshua a report. Now, in Joshua chapter 2 and verse 24. They said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has delivered all the land into our hands. For indeed all the inhabitants of the country are faint-hearted because of us. Quite a different report, isn't it, than those first spies brought back. Those first spies 40 years earlier had said, Oh, we can't take it. This time these two spies come back and say, Why, they're scared to death of us. They're faint-hearted because of us. Well, Joshua then gets up early, and he moves the people closer to the Jordan. After three days, the commanders went through the camp, preparing the people to cross the Jordan River. Get ready. We're going. And so they were told, now you're going to follow after the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark being the most holy um, piece of furniture, for lack of a better word, there in the tabernacle. There, remember the ark is where it had the mercy seat on top of it and the two cherubim that, with their wings extended touching each other and the glory of the Lord would appear there above the mercy seat. So here the priests are carrying the ark on those poles as they were supposed to do, not touching it. And the people were told, you stay back 3,000 feet because you, you don't get too close. 
uh, lest, you know, they, lest they die. And you sanctify yourself. This is going to be a wonderful thing that's about to happen. And so Joshua tells the children of Israel all about what's about to happen. So in chapter 3, in verse 13 of Joshua, he says, And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. Can you just uh, uh, get that picture in your mind? The, the river is, is as if, a, uh, I, in my mind, so I, I picture a hand like the Lord's hand just blocking the water. However the Lord did that, the water is blocked and it just stacks up because it's not allowed to come on down as it normally would. And so the river is, it, it's divided, it's parted, and a little different than the Red Sea because the Red Sea being a sea was not flowing. And so here the, uh, in the Red Sea, the, the water was parted, and there was a wall on each side of the children of Israel. Here, one side is blocked, which dries up everything down below it. And so the priests now, they step into the waters. The River Jordan was overflowing its banks at this time of the year, the time of the harvest. As soon as the priests, their feet carrying the ark, touched the water, the water stopped as we have described. And then everything going down all the way to the Salt Sea, the Dead Sea, why well, there was nothing going for this period of time. And so now the people are crossing over on dry ground. Can you get that image in your mind? The priests are standing. Now they're going to position themselves in the middle of this dry riverbed. And all these uh, over a million people are going to cross over. That must have taken quite some time. And so we find um, during this flood stage that the river was in, why we're, we're talking about 10 to 12 feet of water that normally would have been there. Now, those two spies had to, to swim across a very dangerous river. But now the Lord has stopped the water, and they're crossing on dry ground. Now, another interesting thing that's happening now is God tells, says to Joshua, you choose 12 men, one from each tribe. And now, I, these 12 men are to take a stone from the middle of the Jordan, put it on their shoulder, indicating you know, a large stone, and carry it to the camp. And um, when you get there, it's going to be set up as a memorial. And you, you think, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but think about that. You're going to get these big stones from, from the middle of a river that's normally not accessible to you. And so later what they're going to do then is they're going to set up this monument, this memorial at Gilgal at the camp. And then later the children of the people will say, you know, what does this mean? And they're going to remind them about this great day when they crossed the River Jordan on the dry ground. And so they do that. But they also do one other thing that sometimes seems to be overlooked. They take 12 other stones and they set them up in the middle of the Jordan River where the priest stood there in the river with the Ark of the Lord. And uh, again, you, I, I imagine, I, I don't think it would still be there after all these years unless the Lord wanted it to be, but you know, though, if, if someone could have access to it there, those 12 stones would be in the middle of the Jordan to this day, <laughs> except I would imagine after all this time, uh, those could, would not be reasonable to still be there again unless the Lord wanted them to be and so God tells Joshua now that I'm going to show the people that I'm with you and we see this happen in this story that we've just talked about because Joshua tells the people before it happens here's what's going to happen the priests are going to carry the ark they're going to touch the water the water's going to be stopped you're going to cross on dry ground and sure enough it happened. And so in Joshua chapter 4, and verse 14, it says, On that day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they had feared Moses all the days of his life. And we see that unfold. Oh, not that they're going to be a perfect people by any stretch, but they remain relatively faithful all the days of Joshua and the elders who served with him, and that leads to the days of the judges that, Lord willing, we'll study uh, next time. Now, the people cross over, and it's interesting now, they, they 
they cross the Jordan and arrive at Gilgal on the 10th day of the first month, almost exactly 40 years to the day. It will be 40 years to the, to, to the day. We'll notice another event in our study. But now God says to Joshua, I want you to circumcise the sons of Israel. For whatever reason, all the ones who were born after they left Egypt, they had not been circumcised. Now those who left Egypt, they left, they were already circumcised. That was their normal uh, way of doing things as Hebrews, as Jews. That was part of the covenant God made with Abraham. But they had not been circumcised. And so uh, they, they then circumcise all the males. And they have to wait now a few days while the, the men heal from that procedure. And it's described as uh, having rolled the reproach of Egypt back. And that's what Gilgal means for their camping, is rolling. The reproach of Egypt has been rolled back. Now, it's time for the Passover. Four days after crossing the Jordan, it's now the 14th day of the first month. It is now exactly 40 years to the day since they left Egypt. And they left Egypt, remember, the morning after that first Passover. And so on, on this day, they, they uh, eat the produce of the land, the parched grain, the unleavened cakes that went along with the Feast of Unleavened Bread that followed the, the Passover. And the day after they ate of the produce of the land, the manna ceased. Remember the manna that God had fed them with these 40 years? He said, you'll, you'll get this until you enter the promised land. And so now the manna from heaven has stopped, as God said that it would. The children of Israel, why they, they've, they've been delivered from Egypt and they're entering now the promised land. They've had a long and difficult journey, but God has been with them. Let's look at our map again and notice where they are. They're camped now at Gilgal, just a little east of Jericho. Their wandering is now complete. They're now ready to conquer Canaan. Let's just very briefly now just be reminded of, of the journey now. God delivered Israel while they were slaves in Egypt. They had cried out to the Lord. The Egyptian taskmasters had been cruel to them. Pharaoh had been cruel to them. They cry out to the Lord. The Lord sends Moses. But that didn't go without its ups and downs either, did it? But God sends those ten plagues upon the Egyptians until they finally let them go. They come to the Red Sea, and now they think, well, we're, we're trapped here by the Red Sea. The army of Egypt is approaching us because Pharaoh had changed his mind. And God, of course, is, he's with them. He says, wait, stand still. And they did, and he parted the waters of the Red Sea, and they crossed on dry ground. And then the Egyptian army pursues them, and the waters come back and drown the entire Egyptian army. And so God's with them. He guides them down to Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, as it's sometimes called. And there God's going to give them the law. And God's going to audibly remember. He's going to speak the Ten Commandments, and it, and it just scares them to death. And, and they say to Moses, now, look, don't, don't let God speak to us anymore. You, you go talk to God, and then you come back and tell us what he said. And, and that's the arrangement that they have. And at Mount Sinai, the people promised we're going to be faithful. Now, while Moses was on the mount, remember, they, they gave up on him. They thought he'd been up there too long, and they had Aaron to make a golden calf, and they broke the covenant with God. No sooner than they had made it. And, and God was about to destroy them, but Moses intercedes, and then they renew their covenant with God. They travel after leaving Mount Sinai. Now remember, they spent almost a year at Mount Sinai. They traveled to Kadesh Barnea. And that's where they sent those 12 spies to spy out the land. Now they'd been gone um, less than two years at this point. And those 12 spies came back. Ten said, you know, we can't take this land. We look like grasshoppers in their sight. Two of them said, oh, we're more than able. That those two were Joshua and Caleb. Because of that lack of faith, God says, you're going to wander in the wilderness one day, I mean one year for every day those spies were in the land of Canaan spying it out. And they were 40 days spying out the land. And so God evidently gives some credit for the almost two years that they had already spent in leaving Egypt. And so they wander. 
But now toward the end of that 40-year wandering, they come to the plains of Moab. They come to the east, uh, east side of the River Jordan. And there they defeat Sahan and Og. And they were both mighty Amorite kings. It was no small uh, army that they were facing because they, they conquered a large piece of land, didn't they? Then Israel camped in the plains of Moab. And remember there, it was where uh, Balak hired Balaam to curse the people. And God, of course, was not going to curse the people. But Balaam then sort of coached the Midianites and how to get them to sin against their God and therefore weaken them and maybe they could conquer them. Well, along the way, Moses and Aaron had sinned against God when, when they just, out of anger, probably said something, I, I'm sure, knowing the caliber of these men, they regretted. But they took some honor upon themselves in, in bringing water to the people. They said, much we fetch you water. And uh, they didn't sanctify God, honor Him. And so they were not allowed to enter the promised land. So um, Miriam has already died, the sister of Aaron and Moses. Then Aaron is taken up on Mount Hor, and, and he dies and transfers the high priesthood to his son. And then Moses is taken up to Mount Pisgah. He sees the land, and then he dies. And the children of Israel mourn for him for 30 days as they should. What a great man, a great leader. And then Joshua, who had been, had been Moses' assistant and had been one of the two spies that said, we are more than able to take the land, who had left Egypt and had seen everything that had happened and, and all of the time had been faithful to the Lord. He's made the new leader. Joshua now has taken the children of Israel across the River Jordan on dry ground, we might add, and then they camp at Gilgal. Remember, Gilgal means rolling. They roll back the reproach of Egypt when, when those males were circumcised, uh, representing now the last vestige of the problems from Egypt. And now they're ready to take the promised land. They observe the Passover. That, that Passover, remember, um, is, is to remind them of how the death angel passed over them. When God took the firstborn of everything in Egypt, that was the final plague that caused Pharaoh to finally say, y'all get out of here, leave my land. Though he later changed his mind, but that got them out of there. And so God took the firstborn. And now, 40 years to the day, the, the, you might say the firstborn of those who had left there they were now entering to take the promised land. Remember, the previous generation had been unfaithful, and they were not allowed to take the promised land. Now you might say the firstborn. They're taking the promised land. How fitting that it would be on the hills of that Passover uh, that was on the exact 40th anniversary of their departure from Egypt. They eat the produce of the land, and then the manna stops, and then um, they're ready. They're ready. And so that's where we are. Joshua, now the book of Joshua is going to tell the story of how God allows Israel to conquer the land of Canaan. And we find now that he is fulfilling at the end of Joshua, he will, will have fulfilled that promise made to Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12, where God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you this land where you are, Abraham, but not yet. It'll be a, some 400 years later that after the iniquity of the Amorites is full, that your descendants, after having been slaves, are going to take this land. God says all that to Abraham centuries earlier. Be with us next time as we continue to seek the old paths.